Welcome back. It's another episode of A Fistful of Collars, your favorite jujitsu podcast. Howell Teague, Will Safford, Chase Smith, <coughs> Reed Connell. We're back, back from California. We were there for the 2018 IBJJF Pans. What a wild, crazy week that was. It's been a busy week in general, right, guys? Like, it's not just Austin. Pans. We are all destroyed, but we've been busy doing a lot of cool stuff. Uh, your episode, How I Train with Gabriel Arges came out. That was a really cool piece. Had a blast out in LA with Gabriel. If you guys haven't watched that yet, it's already on the site. We'll be putting up some more clips soon, but uh, a great time seeing how a world champion and most recently a pan champion gets ready to compete. And uh, the mat with Dylan Dennis as well, which is another new, uh, a new series or a new show uh, that will be part of a series that we're producing where we're gonna be doing interviews with jujitsu personalities in a laundromat. Uh, a little bit of a, a different vibe, but it kind of works, right? We've got some cool Stepping stuff Stepping up there. our content game here at Full Grappling. We are, but uh, the main content and the main stories that we were working on all last week, right through till now, actually like four days later, the fallout still falling out. Pans, man. What a crazy pans it was this year, right? Absolutely. 2018 Pan Jiu-Jitsu Championships. Uh, one of the biggest tournaments of the year, always, right? We always get to see, it's a real kind of precursor for Worlds, right? We always get to see where the divisions are kind of shaping out, who's going where, you know, everything. It's a really good measuring stick to see where everybody's at, you know? And, and, and this, uh, this time, you know, it, it gave us a lot, lot to work with. JT Torres had a great performance out there. Leandro Lowe had a great performance out there. You know, it really sets things up for, for the World Championship. So I'm really, really looking forward to Worlds. It does. Uh, it was a four-day tournament. Obviously, there was so much jujitsu. It's kind of hard to condense all that into just one podcast. We could be talking about it for weeks. And uh, we've done a bunch of really cool articles breaking down some of the, the ramifications of the tournament. But let's just uh, let's just go around the table and talk a little bit about some of our standout moments, and we can just kind of use that. So uh, let's will let's start with you. I believe that you wanted to focus on uh, sort of the up and comers, right? The color belts. So blue, purple, brown, all of them were just awesome, you know. And this is one thing that I haven't really been like tuned in on over the last couple of years. Everyone watches pans, they want to see the big names, they want to see the black belts. But there are amazing matches, amazing submissions, and rivalries that are brewing in the, in the, in the colored belt. So blue belt, we saw Tana Dalpra and uh, Mateus Rodriguez at AOJ just sweep the competition, closed out uh, Absolute. They also won their divisions, so they were just phenomenal to watch. Um, a lot of submissions from those guys as well. Those guys are machines, right? They're spectacular, man, and they're they're 17 years old. They're just <laughs> maturing into their bodies. You know, they still have a lot of uh, a lot of growing to do on the mat and also physically. Uh, Purple belt, awesome matchups as well. We saw, um, let's see, Connor DeAngelis. Win the absolute there, and then brown belt. I thought brown belt was like some of the some of the best matches uh, of the event. The guy Mateus Gabriel, no Marcio, the the GF team guy, Marcio, oh, Mar Mauricio, 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 yes, Mauricio Oliveira. He's super exciting. We got to hang out with him at the Ruka facility. He's gonna be just a black belt killer once he gets up there. Yeah, he um, he was a medium heavyweight champion, right? Yep, middle yep. heavyweight champion. He got through Dom Bell in his weight division, but then Dom Bell in the absolute had an insane fight where he came back, he was being choked out. You know one of those chokes where you're like spitting all over yourself, the guy's like, you know, you're just like barely holding on. Yeah, it's it's starting, to, starting to close in. It's starting yeah. to close in. He had one of the, he, he was in a choke that bad, right? But comes back and beats the guy and then continues on to the final to close out with his teammate, Conor Duarte. Yeah, interesting point you mentioned there, the, the AOJ kids, Conor DeAngelis and, uh, and, and Kynan and, and, and Don Bell. But uh, Conor closed out with Ronaldo Jr. So That's that right. was an Atos sweep closing out the absolute in blue, purple, and brown. That's incredible. And, and female black belt. Like, the Atos just cleaned up in the absolute divisions. They yeah. really did. But man, I, I totally agree. Brown belt was so exciting. Um, Kennedy Maciel, got to mention that match Man. too. That match, I, to me, that was Highlight like- Highlight of the weekend. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So sure. many good, you mentioned the, um, the, the Dom Bell comeback. I know um, Kynan Duarte in, in his semifinal, he had a crazy comeback as well where he was losing 
um, by like six points, I think, in that last minute of the fight. And he ended up getting those points back in the last minute and winning. And then, of course, Kennedy Maciel had an amazing comeback. Comeback of the year for Absolutely. me. Absolutely. I mean, right? also, the super heavyweight final was crazy with, Do um, with Devante and is it Fabio Alonso? Oh, Fabio. Yeah. Yeah. Out of yeah. Alliance. Those guys have been battling since Purple Belt. We have that epic clip of them getting ready at Worlds last mm -hmm. year. And they're still carrying on their battles uh, and now as brown belts. That one was nuts as well. They, those guys need to have a super fight or something because they just, man, when they go at it, they're like, they're, fun. they're all I want to see it go 25 yeah. minutes. Let's, yeah. let's see how yeah. long it can last. Yeah. So. Yeah. And that they, was the crazy match. Like, at one point, like, Devontae came off the match, like, crashed into the table. I right. remember, like, a, a huge, like, you know, mug of Pepsi just went everywhere. And it was like, oh, my God, this match could get any worse. Like, <laughs> yeah. it was just crazy. But, but the, you, you mentioned, sorry, you mentioned there about the color belts. Like, you know, having, man, thing is, these rivalries are starting now, blue, mm. purple, and they're just going to continue right through the black belt, right? So this is this is this is something that this is by no means over. No, not at all. I think it's super important to to scout these guys now because, like, for example, Gutenberg Pereira, who was in the uh, absolute against Leandro, he's a brand new black belt, you know, and a lot of people are just learning about this guy, but he's been around for you know. Yeah, through he, he won Royal, which was on Flow last year. You know, we've been following Gutenberg yeah. for for a long time. I know you have been following Gutenberg since, since you're purple, since he's yeah. a purple belt. Yeah. So I mean, like, it's so great to, that we can can find these guys at Purple Belt. They're standouts at Purple Belt. They're going to be standouts at Brown Belt. And man, these guys, looking at guys like um, Tommy Langacker, I think we're going to talk about a little bit. But, um, you know, he's he's meddling on the absolute stage, you know, and, and he's a guy who was a, a successful Brown Belt. And so, I mean, these guys at Purple Belt, like the guys like, um, who's the other guy? Uh, Wallace Santos. I want to mention some mm -hmm. other guys. Wallace Costa from GFT. Wallace yeah, Costa. The Costa. Um, I, I know there's a there's a lot of good Purple Belts. A lot of Soares, of course. Allison. I think Ronaldo Jr., uh, the the guy who closed out the absolute. Man, he, he's he, excited. From eight matches for the whole weekend, like he, man, he submitted like about six of those. I think he is a killer. That guy. He almost reminds me of like a Ted Aday in a way. Yeah, like, he's got explosive. a very yeah. like explosive kind of like flat, but he's also tough too. Oh, like, like, super he intense. Breaks yeah. grips like super hard. I remember when he actually uh, closed out the absolute. Uh, all the Atos guys were kind of like kind of teasing him a little bit. They were right behind me. They were talking Portuguese. And they were saying, like, finally, something that's going to make Ronaldo smile. Yeah. He, he's always, like, yeah. a game face art, right? And Elizabeth Clay <laughs> and Blue Belt as well, the, um, the uh, young, young girl from, from Alaska. She is going to be a force to reckon with through purple, brown, and black. Um, Finished every match. Yeah. One of did. those, maybe not by submission. Ooh, brutal. Right? Really nasty leg break on a jumping guard. A guard jump. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, that got really hope that. Uh, you know, recovery go goes well because that was Absolutely. brutal looking. Yeah, nobody it's wants to see good. that happen. But Elizabeth Clay can't take anything away from her. Like every other match, she looked phenomenal. The first match of the day, she walks on, she smits a girl in like 30 seconds or less. And my man, you flew all the way from Alaska to do that? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> I hope she has some more out a little bit, have a little yeah. fun out there. Yeah. Oh. But the color belts, absolutely, you know, a lot of action there. I mean, you can't sleep on these. We, we cover them as best we can. Obviously, we got a, a, an obligation to focus on the black belts because that's what people want to see, right? But we give as much shine as possible to these kids because they are the black belt world champions of the future, right? And it's interesting to note, talking about color belts, I think that leads into your point that you'd like to bring up, right, Chase? Just a little bit. So. Mm. Um, Following the event, there's always lots of chatter online about what to watch, what's going on in the event. And a huge standout uh, item for me was people were talking a lot about sandbagging, saying that the level is too high at Blue Belt, too high at Purple Belt. These guys should be promoted their way up. They're cheating, you know, they're, they're ruining the sport, so on and so forth. And I say to them, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute nonsense. I agree. Um, first of all, it's, it's legally, for let's take uh, Tynan and Mateus, for the IBJJF, they can't even be purple belts yet as adults. They're not so old enough. They're not old enough. Yeah. So they are just doing their required time at the blue belt as an adult. This is their very first event as an adult in the adult divisions. Ma major event. Major event. Yeah. And um, Sorry. they have to let that play out. They have to let their careers move on before they can even go into the next level. And so, well, is, I mean, is that a reason to be critical of the IBJJF then? Is that a reason to, to say, why, why do they need to... Well, I don't know. I mean, the system is in place for a reason, right? I mean, you know, it's, they, they, they had the time served kind of thing for the belts. You know, the minimum time requirements, I think, is a year for blue. It's a, a year and a half for purple, a year for brown. And, you know, the, the idea was that 
people wouldn't be coming in and fighting like blue, purple, brown in like the space of six months or, mm. you know, because potentially you could get an athlete who's older from another sport coming in and just coming in or, like as a blue belt and dominate and then compete the next month as a brown. And it's it just kind of makes a mess of the whole system, right? And the progression, especially as well for the kids, the whole graduation system, I think it's something to work towards, right? It's like defining what goals and that kind of thing. I, that's my, that's yeah. my understanding of why the federation system exi exists. I, mean, I also think it might pave the way to child black belts. You start saying, okay, these guys are brown belts mm. at, at 15. And now, <sighs> now we're on a very slippery slope there. Let's, 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 not, let's not mix words here, right? Tynan and Mateus, those two 17 going on 18 year old blue belts, would tool up the majority of average brown and black belts, right? 100%. For sure. Yeah, it's just a, uh, yeah, like I said, it seems like a timing thing. But I also think you can be a black belt or you can be super advanced on the mat, but your maturity level is is not congruent with your abilities on the mat. So like, like you're not ready to be a black belt. Exactly. Too. You know, you're not you're not ready for the pressure or maybe you know you you get your black belt too soon and then you burn out and then we never see you again, you know? So by keeping these guys down, we allow them to grow not just on the map but as as people as well. And then that uh, comes kind into of the whole into martial arts element right. thing, right? Because people often see jujitsu now as just a sport, 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 mm. all about competition. But uh, I think the majority of us view it as a martial art equally, right? I hadn't even really thought about it. It's a whole other element to the to the yeah. issue. Yeah. I think lastly though, at events like Pans and, and Worlds and things like that. The level should be as high as it can get. Yeah. We should be celebrating how damn good these kids are and how much the sport is growing. Not everyone's going to get a participation medal. You really like jiu-jitsu. You started at 21. You've been doing it for two years. You're not a world champion. You just you shouldn't be unless yeah. you're some kind of phenom freak. Yeah. And so um, these kids deserve every medal they win because they have put in the hours. Absolutely. Yeah, I remember before Pants, you actually said, man, those kids are gonna ruin some dreams at this tournament because let's let's be honest, you know, some guy who maybe doesn't really have a true understanding of what the level of jujitsu is at that elite level, and you know, it doesn't matter if it's pans or worlds. The blue belt champions, purple belt champions, every champion is of an elite level because they've got to win sometimes six, seven matches to get there, right? And you know, some let's be honest, a guy who's maybe late 20s, trains two, three times a week, and wants to go to Pans to compete, that's not the place for him, right? Exactly. Even if he trains five, six days a week, late 20s. It's you hard, know? it's yeah. really hard. It I mean, should be very hard to win even a single match yeah. at Pans, at Worlds, you know? That's a, a hard thing to do. It is, this is the best of the best. This is the highest level of our sport, in my opinion. In my opinion, the IBJJF tournaments like Worlds and, and Pan Ams and stuff. I don't think you can find higher anywhere else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's you can go to another, a tournament, a smaller level tournament, a smaller local tournament, and win gold, win double gold in that tournament, and then go to the Worlds and not win a single match. You know, the, this is people co are coming from all over the world. You know, that that's the reality that we're in in this sport is that people are coming from all over the world and and fighting, and that's why these brackets sometimes have 70, 80 people in it. You know, winning a single match at this tournament is very hard. Yeah, one hundred percent. And I don't think it should put people off from competing, but I think just people should be. Uh, really aware of what to expect, right? Because, uh, like I say, those kids are freaking scary, man. I'm sure. I'm sure they tool me up. Yeah, I, think <laughs> they, I think they elevate the game in a way too. You know, like you have the potential of facing one of these guys, one of these young prodigies. So, like, man, you got to be prepared. You know, these these guys are, are fighting like brown belts or black belts. You know, so they're elevating everyone around them. They're they're bringing their level up, and the same thing goes for the brown belts, the purple belts. And up into black belt. I think it's just the evolution of jujitsu. You know, it's a pretty scary thought what they're going to be like when they actually get to black belt, right? Like, how good are those kids going to be? How far up, or how much are they going to bring the game up? But uh, Reed, I believe you've got a clip of uh, of Mateus in action. Oh, yeah, from I about that. <laughs> Let's see that. And this is against. This is an example of exactly what they can do, right? Yeah, against uh, three-time NCAA wrestling champion Ed Ruth. Pretty, pretty crazy. Let's watch this go down. No, some people oh, would say that Ed Ruth shouldn't be a blue belt either, uh, right? But is it? on his feet, he's a black belt for sure. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Still need some work on the ground. I yeah. think I saw Dom it's Bell. Just a short clip here, so I got to turn it, t turn it back. Oh, uh, here, right. here's it is. Here's this is the finish. This is Ed Ruth and Mateus Gate uh, and Mateus fighting there. Mateus Rodriguez. Boom! So nasty. 
This is, of course, Ed Ruth. Uh, one Man, of the play that again. Play yeah, that yeah. again. Let's go roll back because it's so quick. It's it's over so quickly. <coughs> Oma Plata. This, and this is uh, Ed Ruth, the uh, one of the most dominant wrestlers in NCAA history, in Penn State history. This is a guy who's a three-time national champion. He graduated from college and went immediately made the world team for the United States, represented the United States on the international stage, has competed at the highest level in wrestling, which is, we all know, one of the toughest sports in the world. And this is a guy who came into the Pan Am's blue belt division. He, he, he fought there last year, too. And he got, and he got second to, to Conor DeAngelis. And this year he got third, losing to uh, Mateus Rodriguez here. So, I, and this is a guy also, he he's doesn't compete in the gi a lot, obviously. He's a, he's a competitor. I love that he's out there. I yeah, love seeing to him guys, yeah. guys like yeah. that coming out there. You know, I, I would love to see more, more um, MMA fighters and stuff put the gi on and, and, and go into the blue belt division, win or lose. Um, but uh, I just I want to point out just that Ed Ruth is, is one of the best competitors that we've seen, you know? And so, yeah, it's hard to win a match. <laughs> 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 what round of the tournament was that? That was the semifinals. The so semifinals. he ended up getting third. But he, and he did. He had three matches earlier. Um, he, and he fought some tough guys. He, the guy from Fight Sports. I forget his name off the top oh, of my head. Oh, uh, F- is Felipe. I don't know his last name off the top of my head. But, but he's, he's a guy who really trains a, uh, with Cyborg in, in, uh, in Miami. And so he's a, a very game competitor. He fought a couple other guys who I know who are... Um, who I've seen a lot in the circuit and stuff like that. So he had three matches before that, won those matches, and then this was his fourth match and ended up ended up losing, ended up getting third. You have to think in that particular clip, like he shakes off the Oma Plata, right? So he's he's about to get into a scramble, which he's probably like foaming at the mouth, like, all right, here's my chance. Yeah. And then, and then uh, that was Mateus. Mateus just the smoothest transition ever attacks the forearm on the opposite side. Like the the wherewithal, like to understand yeah. that and then to land that that submission is just like yeah next to level see stuff. it see it right in that in that just that moment when Ed is flipping over and to somehow isolate the arm and you know that's that's a pretty like drawn out process sometimes get the arm position right. yeah. control transition submission and he's just like bang that's one one move yeah. 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 Yeah, incredible. Awesome. It's fun. Uh, man, Pans is so fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were talking about Tommy, talked a little bit about Tommy, right? And, and uh, he's a guy who we've been, I remember, what was it 2016 Europeans? We, we were following him around um, for that when he was in the brown belt middleweight division. And, um, and then he came back the next year, 2017 Europeans, ended up winning the brown belt division there. Now he's a black belt and... Um, Man, he's one of the best in the world, huh? Yes, he is indeed. And let's just, uh, before we go on to Tommy, because we've got some stuff to talk about. Uh, actually, no, let's do it now. Let's do it now. Um, Tommy Langacker, uh, he's got a habit of making headlines, yeah. right? Uh-huh. Let's put it that way, because at Europeans, we saw Tommy, and he went up against Urba Santos, tapped him out, first round in the absolute division. <sighs> Mind-blowing, right? What a feat. Uh, slightly different <laughs> experience at Pants because Tommy he got his arm like straight up oh, yeah. hyper extended way past 180 degrees in a, a, a just a gruesome situation in a match with Dante Leon now this is after he'd fought in the absolute division again going out there making it through bronze medal at the at the Pants beating the Nalati podium. like let's talk about how big the oh, yeah. is you know right that was all like Nalati. six Tommy Longockers <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I mean, make it on the podium. You know, he only lost to Gutenberg Pereira, like got stopped by the GF team, you know, super heavyweight. And um, man, like Tommy comes back the next day to compete in his weight class and he goes up against Dante Leon. And Dante Leon, another GF team black belt, training partner, roommate of Gutenberg Pereira. And these guys had never fought. It's amazing because they got their black belts roughly the same time, brown belts on the circuit. You know, they never, ever faced off. It's like just crazy. And then they did it pants. And I think we should just play the video and let it speak for itself because nobody expected this. Yeah, yeah we got it's, a, it's a, about a minute clip here. This is about, I don't know, about halfway through the, uh, through the match mm-hmm. here. Um, where it was a close match, but Dante ended up, ended up snatching an arm here. I think this is first round too, right? This is yeah, the yeah, match. I think it was a Ugh, quarterfinal match. Okay, now that armbar, anybody else would be tapping. Now you see Tommy's hand right there. Flicker there. Now Dante does the right thing. Referee didn't didn't stop it, but Dante's saying to the referee right now, he tapped. And Gutenberg is yelling from behind, he tapped, he tapped, he tapped. But Tommy's face is like, just look at that. He's like, Do you want want to just roll that? Yeah, roll roll it back back back. so we can see. (laughs) We can see. Because obviously he's in a deep armbar right here. 
flips him over and, and see, see to me it doesn't look like he taps no, to me it, to looks, me, like it looks like he thinks of, he's thinking about tapping but of course that's not the same thing as tapping no, right? absolutely right. not if he wanted out he would have said I want out yeah, right and, now and, and, and Dante yeah. certainly doesn't let up and no. he's in the arm bar still he's in deep that arm bar still his, his elbow is still far deep no. Luis, please move. <laughs> he, tries, he tries to bridge up right here, and Dante just slams his yeah, hips comes back, back into up. the mat. Boom! Oh. And there oh, there is our arm beyond, it is. beyond 180 degrees. And, and now this is the escape. He puts his foot on his own arm to kind of push it back straight up. again. What a warrior. Now let's put this in perspective. Dante, we did an article on him. This guy, he actually, like his hobby outside of jiu-jitsu is powerlifting. <laughs> the guy's got like a 400-pound well, deadlift or something. And, and then incredible. he wins. He yeah. wins. That's, he wins. That's important to, to note is that he comes back. And then and, immediately grabs the And he arm. wins. Like, and that he... might have been a mistake. <laughs> and, and, and you caught it. Just as he walks off past you, you caught it right there. He just goes, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Man, yeah. but like Dante, uh, sorry, Tommy said to me afterwards, he's like, yeah, I won the match, but I lost me an arm. <laughs> and he pulled out. He couldn't he continue did. in the tournament because, you know, we saw uh, similar things in jiu-jitsu, right? We've seen uh, Jacare was the famous one against Roger Gracie back in the day, escaping a, a ridiculous arm bar and then going on to win the match. Felipe Pena versus Uber Santos, 2016 Europeans, same thing, gets his arm completely hyperextended, comes back, chokes out Uber, just crazy. No, Felipe Pena was out for four months after that. He didn't come back until the following April. That was in January. The question is, how long is Tommy going to be out for something like that? Mm. I did see on his Instagram that he was arm wrestling in the airport two days later. <laughs> so I don't know if that means he's good to go or if that was just some shenanigans. I, I, I remember Hanato Canuto <laughs> told me a similar story because when he fought uh, Brown Belt um, Worlds at... Um, in 2015, he got armbarred and he lost, right? And he had this whole year where he was like, "Man, I, I was this, I was this close to being a world champion." You know, I was. He was up on points, and the guy ended up armbarring him in the in the final, so he got silver. So he had this whole year to think about. If only I didn't tap, I'd be a world champion right now, you know? And so, and, and he told me the next year, almost the same thing happened where he was in the semifinals and a guy ended up catching him in an arm bar. And he had that, th this kernel in his mind. He says, if I just don't tap, I'm going to be a world champion. And the guy, and the guy popped his arm. Guy popped me, and he said he hurt, he hurt his arm, pop, 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 pop. And afterwards, you know, he's talking to the guy and he was like, man, I can't believe you didn't tap. Like, it's crazy. And he's like, well... You didn't want to be a world champion as bad as I did that, that day. You <laughs> that, know? That's, that's what it takes. Exactly. I mean, I think these guys are, are prepared. It's not great. <laughs> you know, you don't want to do that probably, but... We're not endorsing this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they are prepared to do that. Well, so. Tommy, Tommy's day was over after that, right? Like he, he couldn't finish. I thought it was awesome when he was uh, on the getting his bronze medal on the podium for the absolute. You know, he was, he was saying, man, look at all these huge guys around me. And it was like Keenan, Gutenberg and low so i just think that like that's awesome you know yeah. he's like this this smaller he's a middleweight right yeah yep. middleweight and like you said against naladi he just like you know he went through naladi um he but was inverted he's playing inverted guard against naladi <laughs> he likes like to live dangerously 350 <laughs> pounds like it's pretty nuts and, and tommy Jeez. gets like a lot of flack online t um for like his celebrations like some people think he's not you know the most humble guy after he wins he's he's a little bit you know get puts it out there after he wins but after hanging out with Tommy this weekend, like he's a super cool guy. Yeah, and he, he is. You have to respect his heart and his, you know. These guys are competitors, man. Yeah. Like these guys are competitors, and they live their life. They, you know, like th these wins mean so much. Like it's not just going out there and, and winning something, you know. Like these are these people's lives. Let them celebrate. Like let them have some emotion. You know, that's why they're there. And he's he's doing something that has never been done before. You know, he's representing European jiu-jitsu. So he's like, it's much more than just Norway. I was talking to the guys, you know, they, their goal is to spread competitive jiu-jitsu throughout Europe. So he's got, uh, he's got a lot on his shoulders, but he uh, he's doing a great job. Man, I feel bad for Dante, you know, because it ultimately that's a fight finishing move right there. I mean, he could not have done anything more, right? Like mm. literally has the guy's wrist all the way up, round back, round bam. Like Tommy just manages to find a way out. It's incredible. Dante was extremely disappointed and, and he kind of felt a little bit bad that the referee didn't see the tap as well. But I mean, everybody was kind Alleged of like... Alleged tap. Well, it's the thing. He was yeah. in doubt. Everybody <laughs> was, everybody kind of saw it and everybody was like, was that a tap? Mm -hmm. Now, if there's a question mark at the end of that, then I think you, you kind of got to let it go, right? Yeah, I mean, I think Tommy could have gotten out of there if he wanted to. Yeah. He didn't, he didn't want to, so. 
But uh, man, just a, a week full of big moments. And uh, so we've gone through from the color belts by the sandbagging, <laughs> and we've worked our way up to the new brown, uh, new new black belts coming on the scene, notable moments. And you want to talk about man, just um, the reason why. I mean, one of the biggest matches of, of the week. The reason why I think a lot of us were watching are, are the, this black belt divisions. Keenan Cornelius versus Leandro Lowe. It was uh, on the tip of our tongues, I think, all week. is the match we were hoping to see. We were hoping to see maybe in the finals. They ended up getting um, sided on the same uh, side of the bracket. Um, Which I'm not so, I'm so happy about. Yeah, well, I don't know if you heard in, uh, in, the, in Keenan's inter interview there, he said that because he gave... Um, because Hulk had a little bit more points because um, he got the absolute title at Europeans. They he, closed out. He, he, they closed out. Hulk was seated second, so and that automatically means that he can't be seated on the si same side as Hulk, wow. as his teammate. So he got seated uh, so he got seated fourth, which was opposite. Man, so that's a technicality that put him in the semifinal with Leandro. You have to think, man, is, is Keenan kind of like, he's having second thoughts about giving it to uh, Hulk back there in Lisbon, but... Ah, it's already been gone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because Hulk went out. Hulk went out first round. Hulk did lose first round. Yeah, yeah. Um, and definitely, I think Keenan. He's always one of the best, right? He's he, he's always capable of making the finals and, and certainly winning the finals. But uh, but just one of the best matches of the week. Uh, maybe maybe even the best um, black belt match. You know, it was a really exciting match. It was uh, it was the one time I think that day because it was the um, it was Saturday. It was the one time where literally everybody mm -hmm, in the arena. Yeah stopped what they were doing and went over to Matt Six and because that's where this match was happening. You know, it was like literally all eyes were on Keenan versus Lowe and for good reason. We got I got some of the little highlights we can just uh, play here kind of over the um over the conversation. But uh it, just a, a great match here from from Keenan versus Lowe. It definitely seems like I got to interview Keenan after the, after his final. We talked a little bit about this match. And you know, he said he's he's really been game planning. He's really been um, been working to beat Leandro Low. That is, he even said at the very end, he's like, I, pretty much, I'm working to beat Leandro. That's that's why I'm here. And you can see him right there. He's avoiding Low's game with the collar drag. He's controlling that sleeve. He's not letting Low get hold of that collar. He knows that Low drag. loves yeah, that collar drag so much. Here, he does a good job. <clears throat> but um, man, Leandro, Leandro is just he's a. He's a different breed. There's not many people who can who can beat Leandro, and and uh, Keenan's, Keenan's still working. I know that I, I know that uh, Keenan did beat him at 2014 Worlds. Um, so That's I think the first time they met. But I don't think he's been able to beat him in a, in, a, in quite some time. There you can see he's kind of working some worm guard. He's working some lapel grips. Which uh, Leandro was that, right? more than happy to deal with, right? He's, uh, well, he, he said that he's got... It there. Nice. He said that he's got three guys in his gym who do a lot of lapel stuff, and basically they prepare him for Keenan. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of... Uh, that's how he deals with that. Now that's a beautiful reversal right and, there. And that's right in transition, because Keenan didn't have the grip, Keenan didn't have the lapel, and then boom, <laughs> Leandro explodes. And that's, it wasn't really a technical <clears throat> sweep either, right? It was more like exactly. a technical stand-up into a wrestling takedown. That's down. the stuff that you can't prepare for with Leandro Lowe. When he's just going to explode out of the bottom, take you down. Later in the match, I'm sure he'll show this, he has another takedown. But he's just super scrappy, man. Pops up to his feet, controls the posture, boom, runs him to the mat. Leandro is just so good at embracing the suck, embracing the grind of a match and wearing people down. He really seems to just tire people out and keep going that extra, extra inch. Now, we got to mention that there were a few really notable moments in this match. And, and the one that everybody's talking about is the fact that, of course, Leandro passed Keenan's guard. And here First it is. Time. Look at that. I guess it's double unders. Keenan just trying to invert, trying to invert, but... Leandro, like you said, let me get relentless. Yeah. Yeah. Put that in perspective. Yeah. That's one of the best guards in the world. And Leandro just blew right through it. Yeah, not many people pass, uh, pass Keenan's guard, that's for sure. Here, Keenan trying to come up on a, on a single kind of with that lapel, but Leandro shuts it down. At this point, it, it, was, it was two to two there. They both had sweeps. Now it's five to two because um, Leandro passes his guard. So Keenan trying to make something happen right here. Big, Ooh. big takedown. Seals. And really, it was a Seals. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah, that thing. He's like, yeah. And that's, it. that's why we love Leandro. Yeah, that's, why, it is. that's why we love Guy's Leandro. Guy's just a monster, dude. You know, I love Leandro, too, because he never waits. You know, some guys, like, wait out the match and, like, all right, let's see what's happened. It's, you know, some people could say stalling. Man, he no, never people just goes right forward. People all the time. accuse him of stalling all the time. I mean, come on. Like, that match right there, 
That was a lot going he on. He was on the ground for like five minutes, just sucking wind after this. He puts <laughs> everything into his match. But he, he does play coy. Like, for example, yeah. with Gutenberg in, in the absolute final, you can see he made a deliberate choice to let Gutenberg get tired. He felt confident in his guard, confident in his wrestling. Gutenberg was shooting on him when they're on the feet, but he's, he was able to sprawl. And he knew when it got down to the, to the minute and a half mark, he could score some points and stay on top. And so... That's just a winner's mindset. Mm. He doesn't have to be flashy all the time. He can pull the tricks out, but he also knows how to win. You know, Reed, you love to use this phrase when talking about Leandro, is you say that he just, he knows how to win, mm. right? Mm. And we all, well, we're all in total agreement. And I, I, I caught him as he came off the mat and he'd just beaten Gutenberg, you know. Uh, he won his eighth pan title is incredible achievement. You know, he got two extra gold medals there in one weekend, went from six to eight. And um, I, I just chatted to him as he came off, and I said exactly that. I was like, man, I'm like, you just know how to win, right? And he, he actually said to me, yeah, but I, I have no idea how. Like, <laughs> I, I, he said to me, he said, I was in there, and I was just thinking to myself, man, what am I going to do? And I just found a way. I just, just, just found He's got no game plan. He just goes in there and he just... I think that illustrates it even more. Yeah, you right. know, he's just a champion. He doesn't need a game plan. He just finds a way. Really is. Fun really, Leandro, incredible, yeah. man. What a, what an athlete. What a, what, a, what a performer, right? I think that's the thing that people love about him as well is the fact that you know you always get a good show with Leandro, right? Another guy making faces, having like a, a fun time out there. People love personality. I mean, we should really encourage more of that. You yeah. know, really... Get out there. Eight-time Pan Champion, a re, uh, you know, rehash of last year where he won double gold. This time he wins double gold. Um, and let, you know, let's just be clear here as well that Leandro, eight Pan titles, he has never, ever closed out a bracket. He's won titles in four different weight classes and uh, in the absolute as well. So that's like, the, it's uh, included in the absolute because it, uh, it was light, middle, medium, heavy. No, five. It would be four weight classes mm -hmm. plus the absolute. And you know, never once closed out in any of those. And that's beating guys like Homolo, Lucas Lepri, Galvao, Joao Gabriel. Joao Gabriel. Joao Gabriel. <laughs> He's kind of went up the chain there. It's yeah. nuts. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we should talk about Gutenberg as well, because mm. the fact that he even got to the final of the Absolute Division is, for me, pretty incredible. Absolutely. He had to take out Muhammad Ali first, and Muhammad's no joke. Also, a little bit more seasoned at Black Belt. And that was a crazy first round match. I had a mm -hmm. lot of fun watching that. A lot of good wrestling. I was really impressed with his wrestling. And I know we've seen that. He's based in Ohio. And we did a piece on him uh, training in the wrestling room with those guys, with Dante. So it's, it's really showing in his game. You got to roll with Gutenberg. At, at I our... did get the roll. He was very nice. You know, um, <laughs> I'm light feather. He's not. So <laughs> he's super heavy. <laughs> super heavy. Uh, but one thing that was cool is that it, it was just the control. He was playing light, he was definitely not crushing me, but also just controlled and dictated every movement, put me in some crazy positions I've never even felt before, and uh, was just like a vice the whole time. And you rolled Gutenberg too, right? No, I didn't roll Gutenberg. Oh, okay, no. we were there at the, at the Ruka Gym in, uh, in Costa Mesa, California, just the, the day before Pan started, and, uh, and Mauricio Oliveira, the purple, sorry, the brown belt from GF team we were talking about, he was rolling with uh, Gutenberg off in one corner, right? And, uh, and, man, he couldn't be rolled a few people, but who did you roll with that day? I rolled with Espen. Espen Matisson. Yep. Lightweight black belt. How did that feel? Um, man, he felt like a heavyweight. <laughs> he, is, uh, he is super tight. Like, everything about his game, like, you can't... Like, I'm a guard player, so I try to get, like, grips and, you know, get my hooks in or whatever I have to do, spider guard. You couldn't get any of that stuff on him. He's just super compact, and then when he's ready to pass, he's like on your back, you know? Um, everything was just very deliberate, very sharp. Um, and what the amazing thing is that he lost to JT, like mm. in, a, in his first or second match. So it just goes to show, like, I think actually it was his third, yeah, because yeah. he beat Jan Pikapau, and uh, he beat somebody oh, else who I forget. The, the, the day before, he beat um, Freddie. Uh, from Freddie Silva. Freddie Silva from Lucas Lepre's gym. Then yeah, he beat Young, young Pika Pau. And then uh, and he looked JT. good in both those matches. Was, he looked you know, good against JT. Great, he, it, right? The opening was rough. JT uh, passed his guard and uh, mounted, him. mounted him at one point. But so he racked up a bunch of points He racked up quick. a bunch of points right. early. But then Espen came back, you know, with five minutes left and was working his guard. JT couldn't pass anymore. So he, he just got kind of... Um, Blindsided by JT, I guess, but he's able to recompose himself. And, and he's uh, him just like Gutenberg. It's his first year at black belt. Yeah. So you know these guys are going to be probably on the podium pretty soon. Um, Gutenberg, getting back to him, 
he was down. I believe he was down on points or advantages against Ali and then came back through. He was that he was on his back. So it was cool. We got to see his guard, man. He's got a really good guard um, and he's got a lot of heart. And I think he actually looked really pretty good against Lowe. You know, he was like hanging with him for the first like more than half the match. It was no points, 0-0 zero, zero for the first like half of the match. And then Lowe does what he does and found a way to win but man he those two guys and along with uh tommy langacker i think those guys are going to be like super exciting yeah gutenberg had a great performance actually that weekend uh he in the absolute like you said he beat muhammad ali first round he beat uh flippy silver also known as flippy andrew mm. better known as flippy andrew from zenith by submission uh toe holds in the second match in the third match tapped out tommy and then obviously went on to fight leandro in the final and it's important to note as well that that Gutenberg pulled out of his weight class, right? Because his weight class was only going to be on the Sunday. And it was like, okay, do I fight Leandro and I just save everything for that? Or do I potentially fight the guys like Mohamed, Jared Dopp, Tim Spriggs, and Keenan Cornelius, those kind of those killers in his division first, and then fight Leandro later? And, well, I mean, he chose to save his energy. Important to note that last year, um, Claudio Calasanz did the exact same thing at Europeans, you know? These guys are just um, kind of sitting out their weight class just to focus on beating Leandro. Yeah, but important to note that Leandro <laughs> does it. Leandro just goes out there and he has, he's like, whatever, three <laughs> matches today, four matches tomorrow, no problem. So I didn't go out last <laughs> night, so this is going to be easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just to piggyback, just to piggyback off Will's, uh, point there. I think that definitely going into Worlds, that's the biggest storyline for me, you know, is is how these um, these new black belts, there's such a big wave of new black belts, and Worlds has been historically dominated by the veterans of the sport, you know, and we're getting to this time where, where it's, it'll be interesting to see, you know, if the new black belts can kind of can get over that hill. Guys like um, Lucas Lepre, Cobrinha, Andre Galvao. Um, There's a good chance we'll see those guys at Worlds. Yeah, right? yeah. They don't, yeah. you know, they usually do only do one or two competitions a year and, and win those ones. So it, it, it's it'd be interesting to see if if this changing of the guard um, is is a real thing or or if you know. Lucas and Cobrinha and Andre and Bernardo Faria and, and Bouchesha, if, if they're able to, um, you know, beat back the, uh, the new, new generation still. Speaking of veterans, uh, I, I spoke with JT Torres this morning about his pants performance. We've got a really cool interview coming out. But you want to hear something crazy that just kind of blew me away because I hadn't thought about it. Nine years as a black belt. Wow. wow. Uh, it's yep. almost wow. a decade to compete at the highest level. We talked about his rivalry with uh, Lucas Lepre. You know, JT has lost to him at Worlds a couple times, but he's also beaten him for first place at ADCC. That was back in September. And uh, he thinks this is going to be his year at Worlds. But man, nine years. And he, got, he did get his black belt at 19, right? Yeah, so yeah. OG American black belt, for yeah. sure. One of the original pioneers, JT yeah. Torres, for Incredible. sure. So, uh, Pants, incredible. Just w wasn't the only event though that weekend. There was also the Abu Dhabi Grand Slam that was taking place there in London. Uh, it's the final Grand Slam of the season, and heading into World Pro, which is going to be in April. And of course, we were all in Southern California, so we sent the very capable team of our colleague Armin from Flow Elite, who also is a uh, jujitsu practitioner. Keeps Blue that belt. on the keeps that on the down low, right? <laughs> Super low key. Yeah, he kind of does. And uh, we sent uh, freelancer Michael Sears out, photographer, writer as well. And those guys did a great job of covering that event there. But um, I mean, London Grand Slam, you know, we've got all the coverage on the site and go check that out. But it just kind of got me thinking a little bit about traveling and jujitsu because that is some of the things that we are so fortunate to do, right? A lot of these guys are wrestlers and stuff. It's like, where did you go this weekend? And we're like, oh, we were in Japan or we we're in Southern, you know, South America or we're here. And they're like, man, I was in Cleveland. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it wasn't well, <laughs> you know, it was snowing. Yeah. <laughs> so like, I just thought we'd go around the table and say like, you know, because we've all traveled the world with flow grappling for the last couple of years. And let's just really like some of the places that really stand out for us that we've visited. Reed. Where's your favorite jujitsu destination you visited? My favorite jujitsu destination would have to be Finland. Oh, nice. no, 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 no. Oh, Argentina. Ooh, nice. no, 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 wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're taking all the good ones. Come on, Guam. Yeah. It must be Guam. Oh. Guam. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I, I'm gonna, I'll go with Finland first off because I think Finland was just uh, ADCC World Championships, um, just one of the most notorious, you know prestigious tournaments in the world. I've watched the ADCC World Cha Championships for years, you know, and it's such a legendary tournament. And uh, to be able to go there and to be sitting mat side for matches like, you know, um, 
Bushesha versus Shanji Hibero and stuff like that. It was just, that was um, one of the, the most uh, amazing jiu-jitsu experiences. Also because we were in the hotel with the entire, uh, every, all the fighters, so just being in the hotel lobby while uh, Henzo Gracie and Leandro <laughs> were, were, were exchanging stories and stuff like that. It was, uh, yeah, it was a magical, magical place. Chase. Yeah, ADCC was, was pretty cool, man. That's definitely top, top three trips. Uh, but I have to say, as far as destinations goes, nothing, nothing beats Brazil. <laughs> Brazil is the <laughs> best place on earth to, to go on vacation, uh, especially if you like to do jiu-jitsu. The, the gym and the history there is obvious, right? Everyone's got to make the pilgrimage once. Uh, the beaches are, are pretty nice as well, uh, and of course the nightlife is fun. I mean, sounds like a lot to keep you <laughs> occupied. I had some pretty good days. I go to the beach, <laughs> I go train, I go out at night. Um, I, I need to go back, so let's let's get that, that going. That's the real jujitsu lifestyle right there, man. Yeah. yeah. Hey, there's a reason I lived in Brazil for seven years. People are like, "Sir, do you like Brazil?" I'm like, duh. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty sweet. I was trying to do the Leandra thing, you know. Work my way up to being world champion through through partying and going to the beach and <laughs> training. So hey, it works for him. Yeah. Today, yeah. How about you, Will? Uh, well, I've only been on the team for a couple months. I'm the newest newest member on the team, so you know, I've been to Southern California a bunch of times, which is great. <laughs> but um, <laughs> your, uh, Europe, going to Lisbon, Portugal, that was definitely. Even though I got pickpocketed on the first day <laughs> in Lisbon. Didn't put a too much of a damper on the Didn't trip, put right? too much of a damper. No. I actually got my wallet back. So they're like Incredible. nice thieves over there. Um, <laughs> but no, that whole experience, the city of Lisbon is just gorgeous, amazing, beautiful city. The people are awesome. And then I think it was the event itself. Being at Europeans just did it for me because it's unlike any other event that I've ever been to before. The energy, the, the crowd, you've got so many different countries represented there. Um, and just the excitement, you know, it starts the competition season. So from there, we were able to kind of like scout who was going to make waves this year. And that's playing out. We saw a play out in, uh, in Pan. So um, Lisbon's definitely the one for You know, it's funny actually me saying this as a European, but I even find going to Lisbon kind of exotic, you know? It's Lisbon's an amazing awesome. city, right? Yeah, Lisbon's awesome. Yeah. What do you got? Man, I mean, you know, as we have all been so fortunate to travel and stuff, it's, it's really difficult to whittle it down. Um, I have to say it's got to be Japan because uh, even though I was only there for such a short period of time, I flew in on like Thursday afternoon. And I flew out on Monday morning. It was a brutal journey just for such a short trip. Um, I was there for the Abu Dhabi Grand Slam. I didn't even get a train. That was the worst thing. I really wanted to. I was like looking up jujitsu gyms, but Tokyo is like this huge city of like, I don't know, it's like 20 million people or something. Mm. I don't know, it's incredible. It's just the, one of the most populous places on earth and everything's really far away from each other. Like you got to train, you got to get a train or get two trains for like two hours to get to where you want to go. But just unreal it's like every manga every anime movie i'd ever seen like it was just like walking around in the days i was like oh this is so cool so you went to japan for the magnet is what you're telling me <laughs> <laughs> i did not i went for the jujitsu and i didn't really get to do too much but i did get to see some great matches so as isaac bayan satoshi was there of course you know and uh, and just an amazing vibe and uh, I cannot wait to go back. I'm really, really, really looking forward to going back for the Abu Dhabi Grand Slam later this year. What an amazing catalyst to, to see the world. Like you said, we've, we've definitely been super, super lucky, super fortunate to be able to see uh, so much of the world through jiu-jitsu. It's such an incredible lens to, uh, to be able to experience the world. I think if, if you guys are, are considering traveling, considering going to a different gym ac across the, the world, you know, just drop everything and go. Do it. It's 100% worth it. It's gonna, you're gonna grow as a human so much. Man, I'm gonna channel my inner Shia LaBeouf right now and just say, do it, <laughs> oh, do it. <laughs> <coughs> right, guys, I think that's the perfect place to end this uh, podcast. Thanks again for tuning in. Make sure to go to flowgrappling.com for, uh, well, basically all the coverage of the answer we've been talking about, including the various shows, series, and more. More live events coming up soon, more podcasts, more jujitsu. You know where to go. See you later.